All right. So this morning I've got a very easy sermon for you. It's a soft sermon. Everyone should love it. Well, of course, that is if you love the Word of God. If you love the Word of God, it's going to be a very easy sermon. Because what, what's easier than God's Word, right? What, what do you love better than that? But if you love the world and the way that Satan tries to condition you to think, then it's going to be a hard sermon. It's going to be a little bit hard to swallow. So, so keep that in mind. And, and, you know, some people may even leave here hating me. I don't know. But... Anytime you come to church, anytime you hear from God's word, you got to make up that decision for yourself. What's important to you? Do you, do you care about what God's word says? Are you able to, to fight against your, your brainwashing and programming from outside of God's word, from outside in the world, and, and just be able to accept if the Bible says something, I'm willing to accept it and, and believe this to be true and love this word, and if I'm wrong, and if, and if my views are different than the views of this book, then I'm willing to change those views and do what's right. Hopefully that's the attitude that you have when you come to church, when you open up your Bible, when you read and study on your own, that you are willing to be molded and shaped by the words of God, and not by what you think, what you feel, what other people are going to tell you to do, what society does, what the norm is, and what the standard is outside in the world. Now, the title of my sermon this morning is Why I Am a Feminist. Why I'm a Feminist. Now, when you're using words, it's very important to define them because the definition, some of the, there's different, I looked, actually looked up the dictionary definition of feminist and I, I don't agree with those definitions. So that's, that's not the, the dictionary definition of the word feminist is not what I'm stating that I am this morning. I look at the word feminist, and as a feminist, I am someone who supports women being feminine, meaning the way that God created them as a female. I'm all for that. Unfortunately, our society today is not for that. We have a feminist movement that really should be called masculist, because what they're trying to do is take women and convert them and change them and alter them to be more like men. And they say that if you are not in a job, if you are not doing, you know, if you're not doing all the things that typically men have done and have defined men, then you don't have value, then you're not as good as men. This is what the world today is going to tell you. This is what today's modern feminist movement is going to tell you. But I believe that women should be women. And that women should be feminine and women that should have the attributes that God has, has given in the Bible as being godly feminine attributes. And that we should exalt that the fact that there's a difference between men and women. I don't want to have men and women being the same. I don't know about you. Hey, you know, the, the liberals are all big on their diversity. Well, let's be diverse and have men who are men and women who are women and not try to, to blur the lines and just make one androgynous person between the two. Let, let's keep the diversity. I love feminine women. We don't need any more men in this world converting women to be men. So I've got four main points on why I am a feminist. Number one is I love that God created women. I'm glad that God did that, that he didn't just leave Adam alone in the garden with a bunch of animals, but that he actually created a woman as an help meet for him. Look at Genesis chapter 2 where we started reading here. We're going to start uh, picking up here in verse number 18. But, you know, I want to be married to a woman because here we get the story of Adam and how Eve was created out of his rib. I don't want to be married to a man. That's disgusting. I mean, it's sick. I want to have a companion that compliments me, that's not, that's not exactly like I am, that, that we you know, work well together and we fit together the way that God designed us to. The modern feminist movement, like I said, I mean, they should be called masculists. I value women who are feminine as in the way that God created them. Look at verse number 18 here in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air 
and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meat for him. Meat means suitable, right? None of those are suitable. So, and unfortunately, I have a feeling that this is probably going to have to be the type of sermon that's going to need to be preached in the short-term future. I mean, right now, we've got the, the wickedness of the, the sodomy and the, the homosexuality that's just becoming rampant in our culture and, and the acceptance of it as being normal or okay and, and you know, allowing over all these marriages and, and you know, everything being fine and, and being told that they need to be tolerated, not just tolerated, but accepted and exalted. You know what's going to come next is, is the man lying with beast. Where normally we could just read through this and be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. God's making all these beasts, but none of them are suitable for, for Adam to be a partner with. But pretty soon I've got a feeling we're going to have to be hitting this a lot harder and saying, look, the Bible says that God created the beast so that you know, that is not who God designed man to, to be at one with. To be one flesh with. It wasn't for the beasts. But let's keep going. I don't want to spend any more time on that than we have to um, ever. Amen. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This now bone of my bones, excuse me, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. What we see from this story is that the, the, God starts off after he creates Adam saying, you know what, it's not good for him to be alone. The way that God designed man, he says, it's not good for you just to be alone. I'm going to create someone for him. And, it's, and the Bible says, and help meet for him. And this is something that you're going to, it starts off here in Genesis chapter 2, but it's a common theme that you're going to find throughout the Bible is that women, godly women, the way that God has designed them is to be a supporter and a helper for the man. This is why you have the man being the head of the household and being the ruler and having the authority and the, the, the wife being subject unto her husband because she is to be the helper. He is the one who's leading the way. He is the one who's making the decisions and determining which way the family is going to go, and the wife is there as a supporting role, as a help meet. Now, I mean, right off the bat, I might have people angry with me for saying that. But this is, you, again, ask yourself, is this what the Bible says or not? I mean, you judge what I'm saying if, it, if the words are true or not. It's not good for a man to be alone, so he made a help meet for him. Now, this does not in any way degrade a woman or, or lower status. It's just a different job. So I don't know about you. I've, I've had many jobs in my life. I've had multiple different jobs. I've gone to work for different people, different places. I've held all kinds of different jobs. And many jobs I've had where you've, you've just kind of moved laterally, not necessarily any big paid increase or anything, but just different functions, different roles. And as a, in a job, in a, in a corporation or, you know, in whatever business setting you're in, ultimately it's a team. It's a team effort. You've got one person as, that has an authority and then you've got other people working for that person. And depending on, on how big it is and their level of structure, you can have some people in between, but ultimately you have an authority structure of someone deciding, hey, we've got all this work that needs to be done. Someone needs to be at the head saying, this needs to be done in controlling the body, if you will, right? The body of the company. This is what our company is going to do. This is where we're headed. This is our goals. Here's what we're doing. I need people to help me to do all this stuff. Now, just because you are not at the top making the decisions does not make you any, you know, invaluable or even less valuable. There's a lot of businesses that can't operate with just one person, you know, being at the head and being in charge. You, you, the business cannot survive and thrive without having other people helping and doing the work. It's just it's not going to happen. They're extremely necessary, critical, very important. 
Sometimes the jobs that some people are doing are more important than, than the bosses as far as just the daily functioning and running of, of everything continue to going, going forward. So you can have different roles and different positions regardless of what authority that you have given to you. The value's still there. And, and see, this is, this is to combat the, the, the people who want to say, oh, you don't value women. I do value women. I actually value women so much I don't want them to be men. Right. Let's let them be women. Let's let them be feminine. That's why I'm a feminist. But we need to understand what is a feminine woman because people today are getting crazy and, and trying to, to give you different messages on what is a feminine woman, what a woman should be. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7 gives us an idea of what a woman should not be, a feminine woman should not be. In Proverbs 7, it describes a harlot. And in verse 10 of Proverbs 7, the Bible reads, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. So the Bible talks about an ungodly woman, an adulterous woman, someone who's going out to, to destroy and hunt for the precious life, as someone who goes out, wears the attire of a harlot, dresses herself in a manner that's just designed to attract the lust of men because that's what harlots do. They're trying to attract the lust of a man in order to sell their bodies. And notice in, in, in Proverbs 7.10, I didn't have you turn there, but it said that he met a woman with the attire of a harlot. It doesn't even say that she is a harlot, but she looks like one. Feminine women, godly feminine women, should not be dressing in a way that's promiscuous, in a way that's advertising as if you're a whore, as if you're selling your body. That is not the way that a godly woman should be dressing. But not only that, it says that she's loud and stubborn, right? Always giving her opinion, not, not being, you know, you can't tell me what to do. That loud, stubborn attitude and her feet abide not in her house, just going off and meddling, getting involved in everyone else's business. This is what the Bible is saying is not a godly woman. This is not the way that women should be um, keeping themselves. Titus chapter 2 gives us the positive example. Look at verse number 3 of Titus chapter 2. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. These are all good attributes for a woman to have. A godly, it says the aged, excuse me, the aged women, the older women. They're not false accusers, just, just, um, laying out accusations against people that they don't know anything about and gossiping, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things. And who are they teaching? Are they getting up behind the pulpit and teaching? No. Verse number four says that they may teach the young women to be sober. So the godly older women are supposed to be teaching the younger women, hey, this is how you're supposed to behave. This is how you're supposed to act. This is what a godly woman, woman does. They're sober. Sober means serious, as well as meaning, you know, free from alcohol and drugs and all the other stuff. Being sober-minded, clear, serious about things. That they teach younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. If you're married, you need to love your husband. And husbands need to love their wives, if both of those are in the Bible. You need to learn how to love. And look, they're being taught. Sometimes you have to be taught. Okay, unfortunately, that's the way it is. You know, not everybody's life is always picture perfect the way that the, the Hollywood's going to portray it to be. You get married to someone, there's going to be some difficult times. But you need to fall back on that vow that you made for better or for worse because the worst times are going to come. And you need to be taught sometimes to say, you know what? No, I need to love my husband because that's the right thing to do. Even if you're having problems and having issues with each other, no, I'm going to decide I am going to love my husband. It's a godly attribute that the women, the teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You think, oh man, what a whore. how could you not love your children? Well, 
sometimes, <laughs> I'm not saying they don't love them, but sometimes the kids can, can push you to limits that you didn't realize that you had before. But a good godly woman, a good godly uh, mom is going to still love their husbands and love their children no matter what's going on at home, no matter what's going on in family, no matter how much they're pushing your buttons, Amen. that you're still going to love them. Right. And, and at the moment, it might not be your natural reaction to love them, which is why you need the teaching to say, no, I'm going to not allow my emotions to take over and do something stupid. I'm going to love my children. I'm going to love my husband. Verse number five, I want to focus a little bit more on this, to be discreet. Discretion, discreet. It's, it's you know what to say and when to say it. Having discretion. You know, there used to be a time when certain conversations and subject matters would not be appropriate to talk about in front of women. You know, the, the, the term would be talked about, oh, we don't, I don't want to talk about this in mixed company. So I'm mixed with women and children, where maybe there's something that's, that's a little grotesque or something that's, that's wicked, extremely wicked, and, you know, and the guys are talking about, say, you know what, we're not going to talk about this in respect for the ladies, in respect for the children. And there's a lot of topics that, that women shouldn't be talking about because they need to just keep it discreet. You know, you don't need to be, you know, these days, and again, I, I don't even know what the, what the TV shows are anymore out there. But the, the women that are being portrayed as being, this is the standard, this is the norm, this is what people are doing, are talking about the bedroom, they're talking about all kinds of things, you know, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, all the wickedness of this world that they ought not to be talking about, let alone doing. Obviously, you shouldn't be doing any of those things, but then going around and talking about it, women need to stay discreet. Chaste is, is, is pure, is holy. Keepers at home. The Bible says a godly woman, a, a young woman should be discreet, chaste, and a keeper at home. Keeping the household. That's where we get housekeeper from there. Keeper at home. This is a very godly thing. Like the world's going to look down on you and despise you and ridicule you. Say, oh, you just, you just stay at home all day. Oh, don't you think you have any other value? You can't do anything. What are you too stupid to go out? And no, I'm going to be a godly woman. I'm going to be a keeper at home. I'm not going to go off and get involved in other people's business and other, in, in other affairs that are not, um, that God didn't say that he wants me doing. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So look at all the things that it, that it mentions here about the young women being sober, loving their husbands, loving their children, being discreet, being chaste, being keepers at home, being good and being obedient to their husbands. If you are disobeying these things, if you are not following this, the Bible says that the word of God's being blasphemed. You're blaspheming the word of God by not listening to what the Bible says about how you ought to be. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to get another example from the godly women. First Peter chapter 3. And it's, you know, it's usually these days, it's that last one that really stings. Obedient to their own husbands. Because that is not the way that women in America are being raised at all. It is very, very, very rare that you're going to find a woman, be, a, a young girl being brought up and saying, you know what, when you get married, you need to obey your husband. And you know, one of the reasons why they're not doing it anyways is because they see what's happening in their own family. Where the, where the wife is, is leading everything, the wife is ruling the household. So they don't even have the example to follow, let alone they're being inundated with the world, with society saying, no, the, the modern feminist movement, everything is equal. That there is no real authority in the home because it's 50-50. I'll tell you what, that doesn't work very well. I mean, it's just kind of a stupid plan to begin with because what, I mean, everything's great as long as you agree, right? What happens when you disagree? What happens? 
just fight it out until, until someone just finally gives in? Instead of actually having an established authority of saying, no, this is where the buck stops here. At the end of the day, you don't have to agree. And here's the thing, wives. You know, here, this might save you a lot of, a lot of frustration and, and, um, and a lot of arguments, a lot of fights. If you're married to a man, if you're, if you're married, you may be right about something. But if your husband says, this is the way things are going to be, he's the one that's in charge, and you need to swallow your pride and, and be in subjection to your husband. It say, it'll save a lot of fights. It's not about right and wrong all the time. It's about being in the position that God put you in. Now, it doesn't mean you can't talk to your husbands and, uh, and the husbands can't listen to their wives, obviously. But at the end of the day, when a decision needs to be made, there's an authority figure in place that God has placed there, and it's the husband. And we're going to see again in 1 Peter chapter 3, the same rule being set forth of wives being obedient to their own husbands. Verse number 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Look at the similarities between that we just saw in Titus with 1 Peter 3. Be in subjection to your own husbands. And now it's talking about people who do not obey the word. They don't obey the word of God. They may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now that word conversation isn't just talking about the things that you say. It's talking about the way that you present yourself. It's the way that you, that you live. That is the, a, a, the full meaning of the word conversation. It's a, you know, it's a little bit, the, the, the meaning has changed slightly in our, in our modern vernacular, but back in the, you know, 400 years ago when the, when the Bible was translated in English, conversation had a more full meaning that, that involved a lot more than just, just your, your speech and the things that you say. It was, it was your whole conversation is your manner of being. So this is explaining that, look, if you are going to be a good godly example in showing, hey, I'm in subjection to my own husband, I'm not blaspheming the word of God because the word of God's very clear on this subject that the husband's in charge. I'm going to show my faith. I'm going to show that, you know what? I believe this book so much that, I, that, that I'm going to live the way that this book says I ought to live. And the way that when you do that, it says, if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold. So the people who are disobedient, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not saved it's just people who are not obeying the word right other you might have other believers other women that are believers they're christians but they see wow look at this example this chaste example of a woman who's subject to her own husband being convinced and won over and saying oh well if she can do it and this is a good example of someone who believes the bible i can do that too says, verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, verse 3, who's adorning, and you know, this is talking about what you wear. You're adorning. What do you put on? You say, oh, God doesn't care what I wear. Then why is it in the Bible? Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. God puts a high value. Women, if you want to be valued in the eyes of God, the Bible tells you right here how to do that. It's not going to be your outward appearance. It's not going to be the fancy clothing and the fancy hairdos and everything else and getting everyone to look at you. That's the opposite of humility. Humility. When you're getting all the tension on yourself, that's the opposite of modesty. It's not about you. It's about other people. And, that's, and this is the mind that Christ had, by the way. Christ came not to be ministered to, but to minister. He ministered unto other people. He was a servant unto other people. So if you think that like, oh, I'm better than that. I'm a woman. I need, you know, I need to have more power and this and that. Why don't you have the mind of Christ? Before you start getting all upset about, oh man, why, why do I have to be subject to my husband? 
and having this type of an attitude. It's a wicked attitude to have. Why don't you take on the mind of Christ? The hidden man of the heart, the Bible says, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament. So that's what you're putting on. It's an ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Remember we saw in Proverbs 7, it talked about the, the, the stubborn and loud woman who is dressed in the attire of a harlot. That was the wicked woman. The, 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 the woman has a great value in the eyes of God, has a meek and a quiet spirit, and it says in the sight of God, it's a great price. Look at verse number five. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And then it gives Sarah as a great example of a, of a godly, holy woman that was subject to her own husband and lived that way. And her conversation, the way that she lived her life, demonstrated that. She called her own husband Lord because she was recognizing the, the authority that he had. Look at, uh, um, go if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Actually, no, forget that. Just go to Proverbs, go to Proverbs 31. So this morning I'm explaining why am I a feminist. Number one is that I love that God created women in addition to man and that God created them different. Very different. If you're going to tell me that he didn't do anything different, then you're crazy. I mean, God visibly, spiritually, oh, like emotionally, okay, everything. God created men and women very different, and praise God for that. I thank him for that. Amen. Number one reason why I'm a feminist. Number two, a feminine woman is of great value in, the, in God's eyes. God values women who are feminine, meaning obeying the way that he has explained that they ought to be. Number three, a feminine woman is going to be a great mother. A great mother. Genesis 3.20, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. We read Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 3, he names, you know, up until that point, it's, it's called the woman. Adam and the woman. The woman in the garden. After they sinned and, and, and she was told that, you know, she... Uh, Genesis 3.15 tells us that she's going to be in obedience to her husband. And her husband's going to, Adam's going to have to work all the days of his life. And then Adam names her Eve because she's the mother of all living. Her name, her entire name was wrapped up in the fact that she was going to be a mother. And this morning, you know, we're celebrating Mother's Day. And it's a, and it's a great day to celebrate. I, I love feminine women that are great mothers. And it's a great job that God has tasked women with with raising children. Now, we're not going to go to all the references, but you know, when the Bible talks about the, the husband being the, the head of the household, the Bible also tells, you know, Adam was the one who was told he's going to work by the sweat of his face, by the sweat of his brow. He's going to work all the days of his life. The husband's job is to go out and earn money and earn a living and be able to support the family and, and, and pay for the things that the family needs and provide for them. The woman's job is to be the keeper at home and making sure everything at home is getting done properly. Just because the husband is the one in authority doesn't mean the mother's job, the wife's job is insignificant or not important at all or doesn't hold value. It holds a great value. The way things operate, why do I even go out to work? It's because I care about my home. I want things being run properly at home. I want my children being raised right. I want everything being provided for at home. And guess what? When I'm not at home, you know who's running the home? My wife. The mother is the one who's making sure everything's getting done and is the one literally doing all of that and, and leading in the home while I'm gone. That is an extremely important job. Just having children, having other little lives in our families, raising those children to, to do what's right, to know the Lord, that is, is the most important job that anyone can ever have. Right. Our entire, the entire future is based off of the way that children are raised and brought up. The things that they're taught because they're going to have influence on more people. I'm one person. I can only have so much influence in my life. But I've got five children. 
Each one is going to have their own influence on other people. Yeah. So the importance of raising those five children, and hopefully more if God's willing, will do so much more than even I can do. The job of being a mother is so important. It's vital. It's extremely necessary. Yet people want to disparage and say, oh, what, you're a stay-at-home mom. As if, like, that's not a, a full-time, overtime job in and of itself. Oh, you, don't, you, you didn't go to college? You don't have a degree? You don't have a job? Oh, yeah, I do have a job. Being a mother is a full-time job. And it's an extremely difficult job. And, you know, I always get the appreciation for the job that my wife has whenever she gets really sick. That's when it's like, you get that perspective, okay. And, and sometimes, you know, for me, be it, you know, ruling the household, you know, I, I want to get things done, you know, like you need to get this done, you need to get this done, you need to get this done. I, I think, you know, not that I want my wife getting sick, but it helps me out sometimes when she gets sick so I could realize how much work she's really doing because I can't handle it. And that's another reason why <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. There's, there's reason number five that I, you know, I, I, I didn't even have this in here, but why I'm a feminist is that I would not be able to take care of those children nearly to the level that my wife was able to do it. Right. I do not have the multitasking skills. I do not have the, 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 I'm not in tune and sensitive to their needs as well as she is. It's just, it's, it's the way that, that men are built. Right. And we're very one track and get, get certain things done. We get tasks done. Whereas she could be having a phone in one hand, getting food going here, having kids going over there, doing school, doing everything, you know, and, and everything's running. Getting, getting so much done at once. I can't do that. And I think a lot of men would, would agree. It's not, it's not the same thing. And, and, she can tell when the baby, she knows the cries. Of, she's always known the cries of all of our children. Are they hungry? Do they need to, you know, for the little infant, does he need to poop? The, you know, is he hurting? Is there, you know, like, like, like she knows all, I don't know. I mean, the baby's crying. But see, God made women to have those skills. He made them to be mothers and, and to be able to, to raise their children and, and, and to do this away. It, it, it's a great blessing from God and the job is so important. And I don't know why people don't want to embrace that, that these days. Why not brace the feminists? Why not brace, embrace everything that goes along with being a woman? Love the fact that God, if you're a woman today, love that, that God made you a woman. These days we have people wanting to change. Oh, I'm not a woman. I want to be a man. I'm a man. I want to be a woman. That's It's insanity. Don't try to be something you're not. Love being a woman. Love being the way that God made. And look, I'll promise you this. I promise you this. You will be much happier. You will have more joy if you fill the role that God has for you. And this goes for men and women. Men who don't want to be the head, who don't want to make decisions, who don't want to be in charge, you're going to be more miserable by just pawning all of that off and not wanting to deal with any of that than if you just step up and do your job. Just as much as women say, oh, I don't want to be in subjection. I don't want it. I don't mind going to take any orders from anybody. You're going to be much more miserable the longer you have that attitude and just say, you know what? I'm going to be in subjection to my husband. It works on both ends because you've got men and women that are, that are, that are not doing their, fulfilling their job the way that God has designed for them to do it. God knows us. He created us. He knows what's best for us. None of, none of God's commandments, of God's rules, the way that God has given us instruction, none of it is to our detriment ever. Amen. You know, people who are in these, these really wicked lives what, you know, want to tell you, you know, tell you as Christians, oh, you have, you have all those rules you have to follow. You can't have any fun. But I'll tell you what, as someone who came out of some of that wicked lifestyle, it's not fun. There's way more joy in doing what's right and living a godly, righteous life and being able to put your head down on your pillow with a clear conscience knowing that you didn't say or do anything wicked that day than there is in, in having fun by getting real drunk or real high or doing stupid things. 
which are just going to destroy your life anyways. It causes nothing but problems. It splits up families. You're going to lose your job. You know, there's so many problems that go along with that that people say, oh, you have all those rules. Yeah, those rules are there for a very good reason. It's because God knows us. And he knows the problems are going to happen when you go down those paths. So he said, don't go that way. The same way that I tell my children, don't touch the stove when it's hot. Yeah, I can't believe you got these rules for me. Yeah, don't go out into the street. Why do you got all these rules for me? Because I know what's going to happen if you do them. It's not going to be good for you. The same way that, that a parent has that knowledge over their young children, God way more has that knowledge over us. We need to get to the point where we could just be accepting and say, you know what? God, I'm going to submit myself to you first and foremost, and I'm just going to accept your words. And even if I don't understand it, and even if it bothers me inside to have to subject myself, I'm still going to do it because I have faith and I believe that your words are true and right and that you're looking out for my best interest. You're in Proverbs 31. My last point why I'm a feminist, a feminine woman is actually a hard worker. A feminine, godly woman is a very hard worker. And we see this in Proverbs 31. It talks about the virtuous woman. Proverbs 31. We're going to start reading in verse number 10. The Bible reads, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Better than money, better than the, than the precious gems of this world. The heart of her husband, look at verse number 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Notice how the virtuous woman, talking about her price being far above rubies, starts off in verses, you know, the very first verses, go, go on more about the attributes of the woman, but the very first two verses that's talking about, it's talking about her husband. And it's talking about her doing good to him. It's a very important aspect, ladies, to, to, to have this mindset. As I meant, you know, I, I meant to bring up this point when I was talking about, you know, the big companies and the organization, it's a body and you have one person at the head that's in charge of the body. Well, the family is a body. Just like this church is a body. This church is a body and Christ is at the head. He's the one in charge. He's the one giving the directions and we need to submit ourselves to the authority of Christ. Well, in the home, and that's why Ephesians 5 explains this perfectly. We're not going to go there this morning. But in the home, it's a body. You've got the husband, wife, children. There's a whole body there. The husband's the one that's in charge and has the authority. And, but the, the, the point is for the betterment of the whole body. It's for, it's for the good of everybody. So when everybody is doing their jobs, everything's going to run the best way it should. I mean, the way, the way it ought to. I'm doing my job. You're doing your job. You know, the kids are doing their jobs. The way that the Bible defines those jobs to be. That's good. You're going to have the, your happiest family life in that setting. Look at verse number um, 13. So now we're going to get into some of the, 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 the attributes of a woman being strong and doing work. Because there is. It's a, it's a big job. It's an important job. Verse number 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. That word willingly is important there. She's doing it not grudgingly, not, oh man, I can't believe I have to do this. Willingly, doing the work. She's got a good mind to work. A virtuous woman's got to have a good mind to get the things done and need to get done and do it willingly and be happy to do them. Verse number 14, she is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She's looking for the good deals and, and saving money and, and, and you know, because um, that's what normally you do when you're getting food from afar and seeking out the merchant ships, you're cutting out the middleman and all the markups that go in between of getting the convenience. Verse number 15, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Rising up early in the morning. I mean, while it's still night, before dawn, getting up and making, you know what she's doing? Making sure that everyone's got food. Not just herself, the whole household. This is what a godly woman does. 
Verse 16, she considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. And, you know, doing a lot of planting. We've been doing a lot of planting lately. It's a lot of work. You know, digging up the soil, getting it watered, getting, getting everything planted. This is talking about a woman doing these things, the fruit of her hands. She's doing the work here. Verse number 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. And look at this, her candle goeth not out by night. So she's getting up early while it's still dark and her candle's not going out by night, staying up and getting everything done at the end of the day. Verse 19, she layeth her, her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Again, verse number 20 is showing us a few things here. One is her attitude. One is that, that godly inner man that's coming forth, that is, that is in her heart to help other people out. And two, it's showing that she's getting so much done and being able to provide for her family and her way of being able to provide the, fo the, the, the food and the clothing of, of preparing everything and getting it all done in addition to being able to help other people out as well. Having the time and, being, and, and having that as a priority to her to, to, get, to get help to other people. Obviously, your first priority is going to be to make sure that, that you're taken care of in a sense, right? Your kids are taken care of, but the godly woman's going to be able to get all of that done and be able to help the needy. Verse number 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She has foresight. She's planning ahead on, on things that are coming. You know, when the snow, hey, winter's coming. My kids need to be clothed. So she's, she's making, you know, and, and obviously this is a slightly different time than we have today with, with cheaper materials and clothing and everything else. But the godly woman is putting forth the time aside to say, hey, I know winter's coming. I need, my kids need to have warm clothing. So she's taking care of that before the season even happens. So it's not just like, oh, there's snow falling. Oh, what are we going to do? I need to make some clothes for the kids. Verse number 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. That is key these days. There are way too many people who are lazy. If you want to be a godly woman, you need to not eat the bread of idleness. Not only are you not going to get all the things done that you're supposed to be getting done for your family, but you're going to get yourself into sin. And my advice, if you don't have, you know, you don't have this problem. When you have a lot of young children in the house, you don't have this problem. There's just, there's just no way, unless, well, I guess I can't say that for sure, unless you're just simply not doing your job at all of raising your children. There's a lot of people who let their kids raise themselves and they just sit on Facebook or watch TV or whatever and just eat the bread of idleness. If you're doing your job, the more, the more people there are in your family, the more work there's going to be to do. But if you don't have a lot of people in your family, because everyone's at different stages in their life, not everyone has children, not everyone has a lot of children, so, you know, whatever, there's a lot of things going on. This is important, though, to stay godly. You don't want to eat the bread of idleness. There's always going to be a lot of things that you can do. You want to spend your time wisely doing things that are, that are good for your family and that you're not just going to be full of idleness and not having anything to do. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. These are the attributes of a, of a, of a godly woman, the, the virtuous woman there in Proverbs 31. And our, our wicked culture has disdain for the housewife, has disdain for the woman who, who does these types of things. And thinks, no, you need to be a CEO in order to, to, to really make it. Or you need to be president of the United States. And there's all this nonsense and garbage, especially with the last election. It's like, all right, Hillary Clinton, no, she should be our first woman. You know, why? No. The Bible says not to, that women should not usurp the authority over the man anyways. But apparently Hillary Clinton wasn't taught to be discreet 
to be chaste, to be a keeper at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands. It amazes me how even blood relatives can, can treat a woman as if she's worthless because she doesn't go to work or doesn't have a college degree. But it's the brainwashing of, of the society that does that. That is degrading to women. Right. That is truly degrading right. when you're saying that what they're doing isn't that important when they're raising their kids, right. when they're being a keeper at home, when they're doing things the way that God said for them to do. That is truly degrading. Amen. The Bible teaches, actually, it's, it's, a, it's you know, some people want to say, oh, I can't believe you. You believe that? You know, one, let's say you're really old-fashioned, but, but other people these days are trying to say, oh, you're like the Taliban. No. Not even close. But their, their priorities are so screwed up. I would say, if, you know, for someone who's saying you're like the Taliban, I would say you hate women. You don't want them to be women. You don't want them to, to be the way that God designed them to be. And Look at the fruits of what's happened since in the modern feminist movement. And ladies, you could ask yourself this question. You think about a time past. And, and, you know, some guys still do this, but there was a time when men would open up a door for a lady. Any man would. Not, not just someone that you're dating, but I mean, oh, here comes a lady. Let's open up the door. Let's help her out. Let's stand up. People would stand up when a lady went in a room and come to the dinner table or whatever. Stand up, hold her chair for her, and let her sit down. And do things because they had honor and respect unto women. Now, they had a different role and a different function. They're not supposed to be the loud mouth and making all the decisions. But they're still respected and revered and honored. Jesus Christ was born of a woman. I mean, he had to be. Mary raised him. Mary and Joseph raised him. A mother and a, fa and, a, and a father figure. It's an important job, an important role. These are, these are good things. You know, if, the, more, the more time you spend fighting against the role in the way that God made you, the more miserable you're going to be. That's true. That's right. We need to just accept where we're at, man or woman, boy or girl, whatever, wherever you're at in your life right now, to be content and try to follow what the Bible has for you and what God has designed for your life to be. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your words, for the instruction that we can receive from the Bible, dear Lord. I pray that you would please um, help us all as men and women to, um, to be more conformed to, to the way that, that your words say that we ought to be, to not get so angry and upset and, and allow for the deceitfulness of this world to influence us so much, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to die to the flesh daily and to walk in the Spirit, dear Lord, and to, to just make the changes necessary in our lives so that we can be um, just the best Christians that we can be. God, I appreciate all the mothers. I appreciate my own mother and the mothers that, that, that are in this world, dear Lord. I pray that you please help all the mothers to get their, their vital tasks done and to keep, help them to keep the right focus um, on their families and being keepers at home and, and doing what's right for the family, dear Lord. And uh, we just ask for your blessing this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.